I'm back here at Brenda's Cottage. It's been a busy time, man. Scotland was amazing. Hopefully you guys saw part one and part two. We are off today to see a hut designer. I'll tell you more when we get there. In last week's video, I asked you guys to go on and put a little review on for Around the Open Fire. And look at this. Number 29, society and culture around the open fire. Guys, thank you so much for going on and putting all these five star reviews. Josh and I are extremely chuffed yes. that you guys want to see this podcast and want to make it happen. We still need some more interesting guests from different places around the world, so please do put your hand up. And before we go anywhere, look at Josh's clever idea whilst I've been away to make this beautiful little wood store to cover up the horrific propane gas tank. Got some nice concrete blocks in there, I like that. This is the only really horrifically unnatural part of the cottage, so it's nice to begin to cover. We just don't have enough wood. But the beauty of it is it dries out the wood as well as looking nice. Because the wind blows through it, the rain's mostly kept off by the top, and that dries out the wood. Amazing. This is a very nice feeling to know that things are happening whilst, uh, whilst I'm not even here. All right, let's go. I see the look in your eye wondering just how I get it down Oh, I've been moving crazy We've arrived Yo, sorry we're late You alright? <laughs> how you doing? Hey, Mike, Mike right? good to see you, you well? Alright, yeah, good Alright, you good? Yeah, good. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. Nice to meet you finally, finally yeah. This looks great Don't I like you in town So what, why don't you guys introduce yourselves so for the benefit of those who are watching Okay, I'm Mike Page with the University of Hertfordshire. This is a project called the Cube Project. I designed it and we built three buildings, QB1, QB2, as you can see, this one's QB3, 36 cubic meters, a place in which you can live a energy efficient and, and comfortable life, but yeah. in, a, in a limited space. Brilliant. You That's pulled it off for us to come here today, didn't you? So thanks for that. <laughs> Marek right. was extremely helpful with the uh, interior design and also putting it together for Edinburgh. Just a bit of a shame that uh, the building is just sitting here. A building like this should not be sitting in a car park like this, should it? Well, <laughs> Oh, I have seen this on a little YouTube video, so it's not a complete surprise, but the space is big, really big. Marek, how can you put your coat on the side? <laughs> if you've got limited space, you're not always using all of that space at the same time. The loo and the, and the sink are always accessible, mm. but the shower you can bring into play and the washing machine just by mm. moving this wall wow. like Ooh, pardon right, pardon me. The you then take a very small bathroom space into a really large sort of bathroom and utility room and it opens up the shower. So the shower is a standard shower size. By moving this wall along the rails, you take the sink from being in the kitchen to being in the utility room. So it's like you've got a second sink almost. And then you've got your bathroom sink here nice. as well. So when you're in the bathroom, you stand on the bathroom floor mm. and then you come out of the bathroom, you move the wall and you're back mm. on the same floor, but now it's in the mm. kitchen. I've just done my shower, I've been in the utility room, I'm smelling fresh, and then I just wind it back. Oh, give me that feeling. Could you tell me what's the meaning? Oh, yeah. And we can just put my yeah, bye Marek. Bye. Bye. That puts you into a decent sized kitchen. So we've got an induction hob. This doesn't get hot, it just makes the pan hot. Triple A rated fridge there, fridge freezer. You're forever teasing. Yeah, so if it wasn't clear guys, we the, this is QB3. There was a one and a two. Yeah. And George Clark's amazing spaces came and covered QB2 which looks absolutely amazing. So you can see the, some of the 3D-ness about it, the lounge underneath the bed, the bed stairs. above the lounge, and the kitchen, then up these Very little cool. stairs. Floating, 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 floating. Ooh. Dream it, dream it, dream it. It's not nice feed, but it works. Well, get friendly. It's time for us to get close, <laughs> Mike. <laughs> yeah, flip that like that. Flip that over. I'll flip it over. Yeah. yeah. Push it to the back. There we go. And it's you and me, Dave, and we've got the fridge. <laughs> 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 just rotate. The leg deploys automatically. Dinner yeah. for four. Or working. Or romantic dinner for two. Hope my wife's not watching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, that's cosy. That's nice. Just hold the way. Wow. 
That is good. And you can see it just deploys automatically as well, so you don't have to. And there's another lever. There we go, off we go. Rewind my fire. What was your coffee table now becomes your bedside table? That was all the way out. Oh wow, it's, it's like huge. a magic trick. There's only one thing left to do. Oh. <laughs> Full size double bed. Wow, this window's huge here as well. I didn't notice it standing up. As soon as you lie down, you're like, oh yeah. So this is definitely, yeah, this is double. I'm not going to ask you to get on one. No, well, uh, I think you've made your intentions clear. <laughs> in my house in Surrey, I've got three bedrooms, and one of them's a tiny box, yeah. and this is not a tiny box bedroom. So the idea with the moving walls is obviously that whichever room you're in feels big. You make a really good point, which is you don't need the other rooms to exist at all when no. you're not in them. Be in one room and make it one multifunctional. Yes, yeah. And this is an extension of that idea. You make the other rooms disappear. So you're only yes. heating and lighting yeah. really a small space, but it's actually a big functional space because you can't be in two bits at the same time. So it's one big functional room. So heating and lighting efficiencies occur. Yeah. But then you do this magic trick on yourself yeah, where you right. feel like hmm. you're in very different spaces. Exactly. You're in the bed, you use the utilities, and by mid morning, yeah. Those two go away and we're back into the main living space. And you can always nip to the loop. So you start with four solid posts. I can exactly. see the metal foot there. Yeah, so there's a foot under there. There's a six meter beam running across them between those posts. It's supported in the middle, but there's no post at that. Oh yeah. You can see that guys, you've got a little, got the little support and then you've got the beam. We, we were talking about the brackets that we've been making and we were, I was trying to get some input to see whether, we, whether I thought it was a good idea. And you were saying... Well, I think it is a good idea to standardise pieces for the same reason as you standardise Lego pieces. And nobody designs the individual bricks by themselves or the individual struts in Meccano, but you've got the creativity comes from the mm. myriad different ways you can put them together. Standardised pieces, putting them together in creative ways. I think it's a very good idea. Yeah, thank you. The idea is how can we have the minimum amount of structure that allows the most amount of creativity. You don't want to make too many decisions for people, but often if you just say, go build a hut, no one's going to do it. No one knows where to start and they, they're worried they'll fail. But if we can offer through, through these brackets or through different methods, a likelihood of structural success, then the rest is all kind of preference and down to materials and stuff. So yeah, I feel encouraged that you're not poo-pooing our idea. No, I think it's <laughs> Can I ask the nitty gritty of what it actually costs to put this together? We're talking sort of mid 40s with everything. Yeah. With the telly, the fridge, the heater. But then you've got very low heating bills, you've mm. got very low uh, energy bills, you've got very low emissions. It's interesting, like at 45 grand, there are houses up north you can buy for 45 grand. Oh yeah. And so there's two ways of looking at it, isn't it? One is as an affordable housing solution. Yeah. It's a very affordable solution if you can find land to put it on in a city. If. If, yeah. Um, that's the big if. It is a big if. But then if. I guess the other side of it is what we discussed in there when we're talking about how do we drive environmental change? How do we change the habits in our lives? I used to go and advise companies on how to cut their carbon emissions. You can advise people as much as you like, but you know it actually requires behavior change. And behavior change is a psychological issue. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks it's a technological issue. Yeah. It's not. It's a psychological issue. Doing QB1, I was mm -hmm. trying to demonstrate that all the things you should do we did in that building. Mm. We used uh, only technologies that you could use in a building of any size by showing people. Wittgenstein said, some things have to be shown rather than said. In a very different way, I feel like we are on very similar paths because that's very much what these vlogs are all about, guys, is showing you different ways of doing things in different places. And this is very much on the same path. And on the thing about um, psychological solutions to what seems like massive macro problems, I'm not sure if any of you have seen Jordan Peterson, the academic from Canada, who's been getting a lot of heat recently. But in a long interview, I think a podcast he did with Russell Brand, he made this really cool point. He said the best bit of, bit of research he ever did was realizing that this huge disparity problem they had in a university between different ethnic groups didn't need a sociological solution it needed a psychological solution. It needed a solution that worked for one person at a time. And they ran this little activity with them that helped them recalibrate their mind, think differently about their opportunities. But then when they zoomed out and looked at the data across the whole group, across the whole university, they realized that the psychological solution had created a sociological change. And I think that's the same thing we're talking about here in terms of psychology, like putting yourself in an environment that makes you habituate your life differently to how you did before can allow you as the individual to take your part 
in that macro th problem of seeing environmental change happen at a macro scale. So I'm going to sign you up for a psychology master. <laughs> <laughs> you summarise it very well, particularly the thing about hab habitual behaviour. Mm. What people do today is mostly predictable by what they did yesterday. And people have goals and intentions, mm. but they don't do them because they actually their eye is caught by the surroundings in mm. which they've done something else. Because unless you do something different, mm. it doesn't matter how many thoughts you have about doing yeah. something different, yeah. nothing changes. Do it! But that actually just reminds me of somebody I found in my research called Esther Thalen who realised that our learning takes place at the same time as action. We don't think and then do. By doing, we actually inform our mind through our body's actions and learning takes place as we do. Often the tendency is to try to figure something out and then maybe think about doing it. But if we're willing to just try and just do, then you can inform your mind and you start developing that habit on the fly. Cheers, congratulations. It's a, it's a great effort. It's the by far and away the best innovative small space I've physically seen. I've just been doing the rustic way of simple living, yeah, that's right. which is beautiful and lovely in its own right, but it ain't going to help people who are trying to work in cities and things like that. And I think this is uh, an important part of that whole alternative offering basically by definition this is seen as a static caravan that's right it meets the definitions of the caravan act right so we've been having a good old brainstorm because this is an incredible piece of creativity but it needs to find a home and the age-old problem is you need land and you need space where it can be legally used i would love to make use of this place i think it would be an amazing thing for people to come and stay in and experience more than just in a car park or at a show like i said i feel like it's ideal setup would be on the edge of sort of where urban meets countryside so i i'm really open to ideas guys we need to find a home for this place they just told me that qb1 was actually dismantled qb2 was bought by a council in london and used to house some homeless people if we really want to get people motivated about living differently we need people to be able to have experiences in different kind of spaces and this is ripe and ready if you've got any ideas stick them in the comments below i'd be really keen to hear them we'll see what youtube can come up with and then we'll come back to you and, and see if we can hatch a plan <laughs> great thanks for coming pleasure thanks so much for having us so inspiring to see someone actually done something you've done it That's it's very cool. impressive before i forget guys if you want any help with uh Sorry, I went down the wrong road. <laughs> <laughs> Joke quieter. Uh, <laughs> you can you die a bit more quietly, please, in the back there? <laughs> Before I forget, guys, uh, go and check out Marek's website if you want any help with interior design, especially if you're in and around the London area. Um, for tiny spaces, small spaces, because that's where he really wants to head into. The rest of their links are below. And I genuinely can't wait to see what ideas you guys come up with or any suggestions you have for land or solutions or bits and bobs, maybe even, I don't know. Just see what you come up with. I can't wait to see it. Let's go. Come around to pick up the next set of vegetables. And today from Pick It Cook It, we've got Dalen's vegetable stock. Got all the winter greens, parsnip, pumpkin, leek. And so what can we use the stock in that anything? What? Anything, gravy, risotto, soup, really good for soup. Just a bit of flavor. Fantastic. And how do you make stock then? Is it just the vegetables or have you... my secret. No, it's, um, <laughs> it's uh, preserved in sea salt. Preserved in so sea it's salt. It's just vegetables and salt. Simple. So. Just the way I like it. Thank you. Oh, got some good goodies for you, mate. Okay. Yeah, vegetable stock. No. <laughs> so it's a month until I do the pick it, cook it, wild garlic course with Louise here at the farm. The link is below. If you want to come and join me, my dad, please do come down. I think it will be a fun day. Is that you, Phil? I missed you. 